Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Giovanni Singleton, Lunch Homes Coordinator, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today for the opening of our 19th season. So I invite you all to sign up on our email list, which is over by the librarian's desk, as well as pick up a poster um, outlining our events for the entire 2014-2015 season. Um, we're also on fa Facebook, so please log on and become our friend. We'd love to see you there. Um, also on our website, lunchpoems.berkeley.edu, you can view this reading and all of our past readings as webcasts, and also on YouTube. We have our own channel, and we um, have logged over a million views. Okay, So um, do check us out on the web as well. Um, on October 2nd, in partnership with City Lights Books, um, who first published Frank O'Hara's Lunch Poems 50 years ago, uh, we present a special event featuring readings from a newly expanded edition, which also includes communiques by O'Hara to Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the originals of which are housed here at the Bancroft Library. Um, so we will be joined by a number of Bay Area poets um, on October 2nd here um, in the Morrison Room, so please come back for that, as well as um, November 6th, we will be joined by Scottish poet Robert, Robin Robertson. And on December 4th, Gillian Connolly, who's a poet, a translator of Oscar Michaud, and writer in residence at Sonoma State University. Um, also this afternoon, if you're around, actually early evening at 6.30, uh, the Holloway series will present uh, its annual faculty reading, uh, including uh, uh, readings by C.S. Giscom, Robert Haas, Lynn Hedginian, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, uh, the Holloway poet, uh, Ed Roberson, and John Shoptaw. Uh, that will be in the Maud Fife Room, Wheeler Hall 315 at 6.30 this evening. Uh, and on September 11th, our sister program, Story Hour, will feature Jess Rowe here in the Morrison Library at 5 p.m. Um, so now please join me in welcoming our hosts for this afternoon's program, Robert Haas, Director of Lunch Poems, and David Dewar, the Library's Director of Development. Thank you. I'm preempting Bob just for a moment. Um, the, American, the Academy of American Poets announced on August 25th that the Wallace Stevens Award went to our own Bob Hass. Bob, congratulations. I wanted Bob to know that as I went into the stacks, we have a Wallace Stevens it's the 1931 edition of uh, Harmonium. It's still in the stacks. It's still able to be checked out. But the beauty of books from 1931 is that there are ink stains in them, but they're fountain pen ink stains. So there's some, something that helps me with that, as well as the, uh, just, just so we know we're all on the same page, uh, the Trinity Review of 1954, a celebration of Wallace Stevens with three new poems that he wrote for this. So uh, we're, we're well suited. We figured that Bob needed some kind of recognition in order to accomplish the next few years of writing. And the only way, I mean, Nobel laureates get special deals here. I figured we need to promote something special. So we have, we're ready for this, OK? It's, it's not happening yet, but I'm giving it to Bob. It's a restricted parking area. <laughs> And, it, and it's got all the codes down here for, it's an RH, not an NL. And uh, I want to make sure Bob hangs on to this. As soon as I can get parking and transportation to come up with a space, we're putting it on the post. But Bob. <laughs> Good luck with parking and transportation. <laughs> When I was Poet Laureate, they gave me a parking place, and as soon as I resigned, they took it away. <laughs> so I, this is a wonderful event. I'm very grateful to all the readers. It's, um, uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear all uh, people who do lots of different things in their lives in the 
community share the poetry that that comes to them. Um, you can you can go online and get past events. I'm told that our event of this year, last year, uh, last September's event had 20,000 hits uh, out in the world. These poems get shared uh, in wonderful ways. I just wanted to say a word about our next reading, which is the celebration. We called this noontime series Lunch Poems after this book of poems. I think it was the second published by a brand new paperback bookstore first all paperback bookstore in the country called City Lights after a Charlie Chaplin movie on North Beach in San Francisco, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, um, who had just changed, quit his job teaching English at USF, changed his name from Ferling back to his family name Ferlinghetti and opened City Lights bookstore and published this book of poems, City Lights. This is the 50th anniversary of it. It's a book that poets love. It give you a flavor of it. The third book in it is poem in it is called On Rachmaninoff's Birthday. And it begins, quick, a last poem before I go off my rocker, oh, Rachmaninoff. You get the, <laughs> you get the f flavor of it. Anyway, it's a quite wonderful book. And there'll be a whole group of Bay Area poets celebrating it um, next time. Today, we're celebrating the campus and, and the folks who work here. Uh, with a number of readings. And our first reader, appropriately, is LaDawn Duval. She's the executive director of visitor and parent services here on campus. She's been on the Berkeley campus for 24 years. She credits her longevity to working with amazing students and campus colleagues. She's an avid half marathon runner, fundraiser, volunteer for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and Today is her 50th birthday. Hey. Which, as you see, you would never know. Please welcome LaDawn. Thank you. It was actually four days ago, but thank you very much. Um, and I chose the poem I'm going to read because of that, because I turned 54 years ago, um, and because I've been reared, mentored, guided, and loved by phenomenal women. Because women are not often conditioned to characterize themselves as phenomenal. Because I honor and am grateful for the phenomenal women that I stand on the shoulders of, and for the late, great Maya Angelou. Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. I walk into a room just as cool as you please, and to a man the fellows stand, fall down on their knees. Then they swarm around me, a hive of honeybees. I say, it's in the fire in my eyes and the flash of my teeth, the swing in my waist and the joy in my feet. I'm a woman. Phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much, but they can't touch my inner mystery. When I try to show them, they say they still can't see. I say, it's in the arch of my back, the sun of my smile, the ride of my breast, and the grace of my style. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say, it's in the click of my heels, 
the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, and the need for my care. Because I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman. That's me. Thank you. What an amazing reading of that poem. Um, our next reader is Joseph Dufresne Greenwell. He is the Associate Vice Chancellor and Dean of Students. In this leadership role, he oversees key student affairs areas, including the Dean of Students Office, which includes Berkeley Cares, Office of New Student Services, Student Legal Service and Assessment Initiative. He also oversees the new Public Service Center, the Center for Student Conduct, the Career Center, the ASUC Student Union. Jeffy's favorite color is blue, and he's proud to be part of the Cal Golden Bear family. This gives us a chance to welcome him. There are so many parts of making student life work for students that he's undertaken for us. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. Um, so I'm four months old to the Cal family. Very excited. Go Bears. Um, and um, in my time here, I've already witnessed how ambitious our students are. And I've talked to them a lot about the fact that it's great to be ambitious and it's great to really strive to be your best, but you never have to do it alone. And that's why I selected um, the poem alone uh, and keeping in the spirit of Maya Angelou. Lying, thinking last night, how to find my soul a home where water is not thirsty and bread loaf is not stone. I came up with one thing and I don't believe I'm wrong that nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone. Nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. There are some millionaires with money they can't use. Their wives run round like banshees. Their children sing the blues. They've got expensive doctors to cure their hearts of stone. But nobody, no, nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone. Nobody but nobody can make it here alone. Now, if you listen closely, I'll tell you what I know. Storm clouds are gathering. The wind is going to blow. The race of man is suffering. And I can hear the moan. Because nobody but nobody can make it here alone. Alone. All alone. Nobody but nobody can make it here alone. Thank you. Thank you so much. So amazingly appropriate to this occasion and to your job. Thank you so much for that. Our, our next reader, I have been a fan of his writing for some years. Steve Finnegan has had a career as a University of California staff member for nearly three decades, primarily working in physical planning. He's the past president of the Berkeley Historical Society, which is how I know his work, um, a collector of UC history, including campus prose and poetry, writes a weekly history column for Berkeley Voice, focusing on Berkeley town and gown for the last 75 years. He's, uh, as a prose writer, incredibly deft writer, able vividly to convey this place. It's such a pleasure to have him here today. Please welcome Steve.
I've been spending, uh, or I will be spending most, much of this month um, uh, estimating, trying to estimate exactly the amount of the square footage of lawns on campus. So I was tempted to bring something from Leaves of Grass, but uh, <laughs> that would have been too long. So I'm going to be a bit archaic. Um, I've chosen for my poem a favorite that is uh, also, I believe, the first poem written specifically about our town of Berkeley. This was read on September 26, 1867, the lay at the laying of the cornerstone for the Institute, the California Deaf, Dumb, and Blind Asylum, which is now the university's Clark Kerr campus. It was read outdoors on the wide open sloping plain overlooking the bay and the Golden Gate, so keep that backdrop in mind when you hear the poem. It was written by Bret Hart, one of the first literary figures to emerge from the Gold Rush state. He would have been about 35 when he wrote this. A few years later, in 1870, he was appointed by the regents to hold um, the uh, first chair in English, essentially, which was called Chair of Recent Literature. But he resigned without serving, and he moved east, where he had been offered a, a lucrative literary contract. One of his friends later wrote, his fame had become too broad and too firmly established to permit a genius like like his, to be long confined to the narrow precincts at the Pacific coast. <laughs> so here we all are. Um, the poem was read by John Sweat, a poet himself, who was the first superintendent of education for the state of California. And in the middle uh, to late 19th century, no civic or ceremonial occasion was complete without a commissioned or at least a topically relevant oration, uh, rich with classical and literary allegory. Hart followed form with this poem. He was presumably confident that the audience would, would readily appreciate um, the numerous Christian re references, the uh, biblical Bethesda, the pool of miraculous healing, and the classical orator Demosthenes walking the shores of Greece with a mouthful of pebbles, painfully learning to speak without stuttering. This will all be relevant. Uh, the stone reference at the end is also to the building stones used to construct the first deaf school, school structure. That building burned, but the stones are still there in the wall along Derby and Warring Street as you pass by the Clark Kerr campus. Uh, the poem's unnamed, but it's sometimes referred to as Our Bethesda. Uh, and I think it's the first formal beginning of poetry here in Berkeley. And I have to put a hat on because for a civic occasion back then, people would have been wearing hats. This isn't the right sort of hat, but it will do. OK, so our Bethesda. Fair the terrace that overlooks curving bay and sheltered nooks, groves that break the western blasts, steeple distance fringed with masts, and the gate that fronts our home with its bars of cold sea foam. Here no flashing signal falls over darkened sea and sail. Here no ruddy lighthouse calls, white-winged commerce with its hail. But above the peaceful veil, watchful, silent, calm and pale, science lifts her beacon walls. Love alone, the lamp whose beam shines above the troubled stream. Here shall patience, wise and sweet, gather round her waiting feet, God's unfinished few whom fate and their failings consecrate, haply that her skill create what his will left incomplete. Ah, Bethesda's pool no more, sees the miracles of yore. Faith no more to blinded eyes, brings the light that skill denies. Not again shall part on earth, lips that nature sealed from birth. Though his face the master hides, love eternal still abides underneath the arching sky. And his hand through science guides, speechless lip and sightless eye. This is our Bethesda's pool, this our thaumaturgic school. We, O oh Lord, more dumb than these, knowing but of bended knees, and the sign of clasped hands here upon our western sands, by these broad Pacific seas, through these stones are eloquent, and our feeble, faltering speech gains what once the pebbles lent on the legendary beach unto old Demosthenes. Thank you. Thank you. I was trying to think of a response to that. What I was working on was to sum the laurel, sum the palm, thank you, Stephen Finicom. How was that? <laughs> <laughs> or the other one would be, um, I had a friend in graduate school who took the first paragraph of um, uh, 
Henry James is the ambassador and turned it into a long-lined poem and called it Lawns of Grass, which was <laughs> what, what you were working on. So I was working on um, uh, In the Middle of a Drought, Too Much Lawn, all about, but I couldn't get to the rhyme part, but <laughs> we'll work on that. Um, lots of people complain, say that they love teaching, but that academic life is full of incredible nuisance work. And they ask me about Berkeley, and I say, actually, it's a dream. It really works very well. And it works partly because the staff here is, at all levels, so tremendously committed and gifted. And I get to experience it in my own department, uh, because Alex Mastrangeli, who's a Berkeley grad, an MBA from Cal State Hayward, has been uh, manager of our department for the last couple of years, and he just makes life easy for all of us by uh, seeming to have everybody else happy about their job and working at it and have the place work. So it's a chance to say thank you to him. His interests include poetry, the outdoors, and long walks in the country. Please welcome Alex. Sorry, I don't have a long speech prepared to preface the poem I'm going to read, but it's always been something that's meant something significant to me since I was a kid. I like the outdoors. I like to go walking. I generally choose the path that's less trodden, so I'm reading Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step at trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, some more ages and ages hence. Two, word, two roads diverged in a wood and I. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you. We love this classicalness of, of, of these readings. Thank you, that was wonderful. Um, it's a good break now. Uh, Bob actually has to teach, and this always happens at lunch poems at 1230. He has a class. We try and convince him sometimes to bring his students here, and he does, but today he's off. So I'm going to fill in as best I can, but it's an appropriate time because we're beginning with one of our three library readers who work in the UC Berkeley Library. Steve Mendoza is Assistant for Romance and Dutch Language Collections at the UC Berkeley Libraries. He and I share a, a mutual love of Santa Fe. I have family there, and he goes there all the time, so it's the same effect. Um, he, has, he previously worked in the music library, and, uh, and we're getting there, and the former uh, government documents library here at Cal. In uh, 2008, he was awarded a Chancellor's Outstanding Staff Award for his work on the Berkeley Initiative for Leadership on Diversity Steering Committee, Steve Mendoza. Thanks. Yeah, so I do actually work with um, Dutch collections here at the library on an interim basis, and but I've had a long-standing interest in Dutch language and literature. Um, two poets, Dutch poets, are Remco, Remco Kampert and Gerrit Kurenaar, who were who are part of what was the the fifties writers, the Vijftigers from um, the Netherlands and Belgium and also Denmark in a, in a, in a strange way. Uh, both of them are still alive. Um, Remco Kampert was born in 1929, and Gerrit Kurenaar was born in 1923. Uh, the first poem by Kampert was written in 1952, and the Kurenaar was written in 2002. Um, despite the length of time, I think they kind of both go together. I'm going to read the first one in Dutch, and then um, the two poems in, in translation. 
Uh, the first one by Compert is called A Poem in Vain, in Vergeefs Gedicht. So als je loop door de kamer uit het bed, naar de tafel met de kam, zal geen regel ooit lopen. So als je praat met je tanden in mijn mond, in je oren in mijn tong, zal geen pen ooit praten. So als je zwijgt met je bloed in mijn roeg, door je ogen in mijn hals, zal geen poëzie ooit zwijgen. As you walk through the room from the bed to the table with the comb, no line will ever walk. As you speak with your teeth in my mouth and your eyes on my tongue, no pen will ever speak. As you are silent with your blood in my back, through your eyes in my neck, no poetry will ever be silent. And by Herod Kurinar, a totally white room, and total vitakamer. Let us once again make the room white, once again, totally white room, you, me. There is no time to waste. One more time, make the room white, now, never, ever again. And that we almost perfect mimicking into type, whiter than readable. Then once more the room for all time complete. As we lay there, lie whiter than together. Thank you. Thank you. We always have to have a few translations, I think, to make this day wonderful. Thank you, Steve. Um, <clears throat> Carolyn Merchant is a professor of environmental history, philosophy, and ethics in the ESPM Division of Society and Environment. I find this interdisciplinarity here in our, on our campus, uh, the students that we hire in our office, no one has a simple major, it seems, because of this collectiveness. So thank you for bringing that to us today. She is the author of 10 books, including The Death of Nature, Ecological Revolutions, and Reinventing Eden, The Fate of Nature in Western Culture. She is working on a new book on the history of the Audubon Society entitled Spare the Birds, and I do need to recognize her in 2011 she was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Carolyn, welcome. This poem, entitled The Lesson, introduces the concluding chapter of my book, Reinventing Eden. And that chapter is on partnership between humans and nature. The Lesson by David Iltis. Saturday afternoon, and I have driven out to Farmington Bay to watch the birds, hoping they will teach me what they know about life. So much more than I know, or less. For two hours I have been here. Five people have come and gone, while the birds stay patient teachers, only five people and me, so close to the city and the quiet solitude is only broken by a howling in the distance of tires on concrete. So close to the city, 
Where is everyone? Stuck in ignorance? Asleep at the wheel? There are patient teachers here, but no patient students, save one. But I am in a hurry, so little time to learn. Am I missing the lesson completely, or has school just begun? Earlier, a snowy egret appeared to me from afar, rippled by heat waves. He stood there, wisely waiting, perhaps talking, but too quietly for me to hear. To move slowly at the edge of the Great Salt Lake is to move here at the speed of life. To drink in the heat and the sun, to watch time unfold and hear the song of the red-winged blackbird and see the ripples on the quiet water from the grebe. To sit and see the butterflies the city has no room for. To watch the work of the bees in service of their queen. To ponder the weeds and the native flora. To share the moment with a damselfly. To see in the distance the wasatch and the remnants of winter fading carpet of snow, to revel in the future of evolution and get laughed at by the California gulls, to stare uncomprehendingly at the skeletons of trees, roosts for the bald eagle and the great blue heron, to glimpse a spider's web, sewing together two plants an eternity apart, to dream with eyes wide open, to awake from my lesson, sobbing at the beauty of it all. And my teachers sing back, you are learning. David Iltis graduated from Cal Berkeley with a double major in mathematics and computer science. David Iltis is my son. <laughs> Carolyn, thank you. Um, as someone who spends somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,200 a month on bird seed for my feeders, <laughs> I appreciate this, this moment because I take a lot of those too, but thank you for sharing that. Um, Eric Mitchell is our Associate University Librarian for Digital Initiatives and Collaborative Services here at the UC Berkeley Library. Um, Eric's research, this is, this is going to be good because I, I was practicing this. Eric's research uh, focuses on design and community impact issues in metadata research as well as information technology development and adoption in cultural memory and heritage institutions. Right. <laughs> We're wondering what he's going to read is the thing. Uh, Eric holds a doctorate in information and library science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a master's in library science from the University of South Carolina, the other USC, and a bachelor of arts in literature from Lenoir Ryan College. Eric, welcome. Uh, so growing up in South Carolina, I uh, never knew that there was another USC um, here in California. And so that explained to me, or I realized what, um, why we didn't have USC.edu um, as our domain name later on. So as I was thinking about the uh, poem that I wanted to read from today, uh, I reflected back on my own experience coming to Berkeley about a year ago, and so it's welcome to Cal, right? It's a new experience. And I was thinking about the experience that new students have coming to UC Berkeley. And the first chapter of a book by Dory Sanders uh, stuck out to me, a book called Her Own Place. So what I'd like to read to you today is the first couple of paragraphs from chapter one. And so I'll give you the first line now. And I think if you sw uh, swap the first line, you get the notion that I'm referring to. So the book begins with the line, the house was new, but an old person lived in it. And so having recently bought a very old house in Berkeley, 
I can say, well, the house was old, but a somewhat new or somewhat young person lived in it. And I think our, new, our students are having that same experience here. Right. The house was new, but an old person lived in it. There were all the visible signs. A young person would have followed the carefully balanced landscape of the builder. But these flowers and shrubs were carted in from the old place, planted like browning snapshots in a poorly arranged old photo album. A little ragged around the edges and straggly, like orphan plants with their support systems removed. The plants were very much like the owner of the house, a woman named May Lee Barnes. Her children, who had grown up surrounding her like plants in a carefully tended perennial bed, had removed themselves and left visible the now uneven edges of her life. May Lee fingered the virgin brass doorknob on the heavy front door with set in panels, thinking how grand it would have been for her children to grow up here. She smiled at the thought of her pretty daughters dressed in their Sunday best, spending long summer afternoons on the front porch with their Sunday visitors. But at least now, through the generosity in helping her build it, this new house would be there for them and their children. She walked inside, leaned against the closed door, and gazed at the clutter. She felt crowded by the abundant display of things, a collection which seemed to belong to someone who had lived for a very long time. She had moved an old past into a new house. It made her feel older than her years, old in mind. She felt a twinge of guilt. Spring was almost over, and she had not cleaned a single room. She could not help thinking, what would my mama say? For years, she carried out the same rituals as her mother and generations before her. Spring cleaning with all the winter garments and blankets hung outside. It always sprinkled or always sprinkled with mothballs and always eaten with holes by winter. These seasonal habits were performed with the exactness of migrating birds, renewing their contract with the emerging spring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, prose and poetry, I mean, it's, it's the same. That's why we have a story hour series also, and they intertwine here. So I think that's very poetic, lovely. Thank you. Um, another of my library colleagues, Shannon Monroe, who was recently promoted to head of interlibrary lending and photo duplication here at UC Berkeley. And if you don't use the ILL service here or Baker, you will one day, I guarantee you. Um, she's worked in the interlibrary service department for over 15 years now. She received her history degree at Cal and focuses on writing and traveling for music in her free time. And she has a new book. It is an electronic book. I've told her I need it in print, but it's a small collection of poems, and it is available online, even on the dreaded Amazon. Um, and Shannon also is an author, but she's not talking about that. But uh, I'm happy that she agreed to come and read with us today. Shannon. Um, so I'd like to first off just say thanks to Professor um, Hass and Giovanni, of course David, um, for the invitation. Um, I've always loved poetry and uh, I actually took a class with Professor Haas here, Professor Haas when I was here at Cal and um, it was one of the best. So um, David has been harassing me about doing this for a long time. Thankfully, um, it worked out. So thank you, David, for being really supportive. Um, so in order to do this for the first time, um, I decided to read a couple of songs by um, my favorite band, Pearl Jam, because I'm only comfortable on tour singing with my friends. And of course, I'm going to spare you all by not singing. I'm just going to read them and uh, hopefully do my Pearl Jam family justice as I read them. So, just a couple of songs. This first one is kind of an improv. So every city that uh, they play it in, some of the lyrics change, but this particular um, version of it is my favorite. It's from a show in Cincinnati, Ohio from 
the summer of uh, 2000. It's called Untitled. Got a car, got some gas. Oh, let's get out of here. Get out of here fast. Everyone's confused. So I stay in my room. I want to go, but I want to go alone. I hope you get this message, because you're not home. I could pick you up in 28 minutes or so. You don't have to take your things. You can use all of mine. I want to go. I don't feel like we've got much time. Oh, come on, let's go. Let's go, will you be mine? It's hard to ask you to be mine. But here it is, baby. I don't got no more time. And the next one is called Footsteps. <clears throat> don't even think about reaching me. I won't be home. Don't even think about stopping by. Don't think of me at all. I did what I had to do. If there was a reason, it was you. Don't even think about getting inside. Voices in my head. Voices. I got scratches all over my arms. One for each day since I fell apart. Oh, I did what I had to do. If there was a reason, it was you. Footsteps in the hall, it was you. You. Pictures on my chest, it was you. It was you. I did what I had to do. And if there was a reason, oh, there wasn't no reason, no. And if there's something you'd like to do, just let me continue to blame you. Footsteps in the hall, it was you, you. Pictures on my chest, it was you, you. Thanks. A few years back, I, I was prevailed upon to read, and unaccustomed as I am to public appearances, I, I agreed. And I thought about it, and I was going to read some Bob Dylan. And then I thought, well, it's music, but it's poetry. So I decided to do one of my grandmother's fav favorite poets, uh, Robert Service, and I read The Cremation of Sam McGee, and I thought, ooh. But then Robert, uh, Professor Charlie Towns followed me and he read Casey at the Bat. And I thought, <laughs> yes, thank you. Little Pearl Jam's always good. We're concluding today with uh, Kim and so uh, Scholender, who is a professor in the departments of bioengineering and plant and microbial biology. Um, actually, she is acquainted with Eric because we have the big data group setting up across the hall here. And if you don't know of them, you'll know more soon. Um, and uh, she's a co-PI in the new Berkeley Institute of Data Science, led by Nobel laureate Saul Perlmutter, who was here last week doing something down in uh, outside of the Moffett Library in our Center for New Media. And she's a member of the Center for Computational Biology. Her research in computation biology explores the connection between evolution and protein structure and function. In her spare time, she reads and writes poetry, which is something we learned after inviting her, and other forms of creative writing. She collects rare bamboos and other plants for her garden and is an avid bird watcher. See? Uh, and I will add, too, as I did with Carolyn, uh, in 2003, she was a presidential early career awardee for scientists and engineers. Quite a distinction. Welcome, Kim. I want to say that um, when I got the email inviting me to read a poem, it took me two seconds to say yes. <laughs> And it took me until the last few minutes to figure out which poem to read. Because there's so many amazing poets. And when you read poetry, the amazing thing about poetry is you can enter the mind of the poet. And that person encompasses a universe that you can explore. And some of those are amazing universes. So it was a very difficult decision. And um, I will just say I really considered Mary Oliver and Louise Erdrich before deciding to go back to Pablo Neruda. Pablo Neruda is 
I see some smiles. He's an amazing, wonderful poet. And if you've been to Chile or you have a chance to go to Chile, you can see his homes. My oldest daughter lives in Chile. I think he's best known for his romantic poetry. Um, but I'm not going to read one of those. I'm going to read Keeping Quiet. And there are some references in here to the, the pain and hardship of war and the destructiveness of war. And given what's going on in the world right now, I think it's important to remember what we can do internally to help ourselves not contribute to that dynamic. Now we will count to 12 and we will all keep still. For once on the face of the earth, let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for one second and not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment without rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Fishermen in the cold sea would not harm whales and the man gathering salt would look at his hurt hands. Those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors, would put on clean clothes and walk around with their brothers in the shade doing nothing. What I want should not be confused with total inactivity. Life is what it is about. I want no truck with death. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving and for once could do nothing, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth can teach us as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. Now I'll count up to 12 and you keep quiet and I will go. Wow, what an amazing afternoon, right? Um, thank you all for coming. And I hope to see you uh, here next month in October. Thank you. Thank you.